And uh, particularly people of my age or older, we tend to kind of hang on to things and um, sometimes it's, it's good to have that big giant garage sale or something going on. So uh, something that we can be thinking about all the time. So welcome. I want to quickly introduce the staff people that are, are the team members that I have here and they're all here up in the front. Um, I'll just start here on my far uh, right. David Hare, Ryan Fortson, Ellen Topper, Mindy Word, and Keith uh, Schultz. And then in the back, we have Anna Kelsey, who uh, really works for Friends of Winnicky. Just heard of that guy. But she's here to help do this tonight because we, we figure that all balances out. And then we have a, some experts that we're going to introduce here in just a little bit. So we're going to get right into it um, and talk about what we can do to try to get house ready to list a home. First thing that a lot of people forget is getting out and looking at the front of their house. Because we don't go in the front door. We pull in the garage and we come in the garage door. So we don't know what's going on out there. And I show a lot of houses that have cobwebs, that the uh, door knockers are all tarnished, that the kick plates all tarnished, that the, the, the uh, little porch is dirty. So first place you need to start is to go out and look at your front the landscaping and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute so go through go out front and even if you continue to go through the attached garage make sure that you're looking at what you need to do so that's where we want to start so then this is what we see a lot of too and I didn't have a landscaper come tonight but you know we see a lot of overgrown uh, bushes and look at the difference in these two pictures I mean how much more appealing and inviting it is to see, you can see the house, you, you know that you're gonna come in and you start out with a very positive impression instead of a negative impression. We show a lot of houses that, you know, we're lucky to get the people in. And when I'm on Channel 14 doing the Ask the Expert, I always tell people, look at everything around you. So, um, you know, we, we, we think that people are looking. So then, staging tip, tips. And it, I know you all have immaculate homes that have no dust or any dirt anywhere. But just in case you don't want to do all that extra cleaning, you might think about hiring a cleaning service. Because you can tell, when, you, when we go in to show a house, we can tell if a house is really clean and if it is not so clean. So, and you want to make sure that um, your house is, is immaculate. Um, if you have pets, and we love pets, but a lot of people have pets and then their houses not only they have fur and, and all of that, but then their houses smell like pets. And sometimes we don't know that they smell like pets because we live there and we have the pets. So uh, there's several things that you can do. You can obviously clean. You can have your ducts cleaned, and there are several services that do that. You can have the, um, uh, you can hire a company that has an ionizer, and they take a lot of that smell out. So, um, and if you have really bad pet smells, now there are companies that can get, where well, pets have had accidents and those kind of problems, there are companies that can get that out. So there are people around. That's a little bit more expensive than just having your ducks clean. So, um, so really, really clean. Okay, this is the biggest thing. And, um, I, and now let me tell you what I did when we sold our personal home five years ago. I went through and I took what I thought everything out. Pictures, dead plants, all of those kinds of things out of the house. Um, and then I went back through, that was like two weeks before we listed it, then I went back through like the night before I listed it. I took out another three or four boxes of stuff. And after two weeks on the market, when I thought my house should sell the first day, like everybody does, I went back through and took some more stuff out. So, um, and I think we say it, sellers want buyers focused on your home, not your stuff. And a lot of times if we have a lot of stuff, then it hides the architectural features. So you come in, maybe you have beautiful arches, or you have um, some beautiful woodwork, or a really nice hearth and a fireplace. If there's so much stuff around it that people can't see it, 
then they're not going to buy it. Okay, the biggest culprit, silk plants. Uh, people have them everywhere, silk arrangements, silk plants, on top of cabinets, in cabinets, all over cabinets. I had one client that had to throw away 41 silk arrangements. Uh, they just, they um, crowd rooms, they make rooms look busy, and usually they're dusty. So just get, you know, and if you have to keep them, that's okay. Put them in bags and put them in the garage and, you know, take them to your next place. So we recommend that nothing on the top of the cabinet, um, I already talked, <laughs> I already talked about my pet peeves, silk plants. And um, uh, basically no personal photographs. You would be shocked at how much time people spend looking at photographs and trying to figure out who the people are in the photographs. And <laughs> you're like, okay, seriously, don't worry about those people. Look at the house. So that's why we do that. It's not that we don't like your family or we think that they're not gorgeous, but it's because of that. Um, so the next big thing is going neutral. Um, this makes a huge difference and I, I, I know wallpaper is coming back in. So, um, but any wallpaper that is five years old or older should come down and the room should be painted and off white, a beige, and the new big color is gray. I was with, um, and Tammy will talk this part a little bit too. I was with some new young clients yesterday and um, these they went in brand new homes. Two of them were painted with the old beige color and no, that wasn't good enough. They you know, wanted to have something that's gray. So that's the new hot color right now. They'll probably change. Um, but this just is practical. It just makes the houses look, and you can look at some um, pictures that we've had and about 90% of the time people will start out, oh, I really want to keep this wallpaper and by the time we sell it, the wallpaper's gone. So folks, you might as well rip off the band-aid at the beginning and get rid of it. Um, so then we want you to make, if you have some minor repairs and we've got some people here that can help with that or um, things that just take away from um, the attractiveness of your home, you don't want people looking if there's cracks in the walls, if there's um, any kind of you know, blemish, those kinds of things. You wanna have those little repairs done because in the long run, that little bit of money that you're gonna spend, you're gonna get back. So you're making an investment on um, what you can get back. So do those touch-ups and I have the painter in and it's probably not as expensive or time consuming as you think it might be. And then this is really simple, but you know, this causes, and I've had on the poor inspectors get uh, somebody going into their house and later after they've sold and, oh, I think something's wrong with that light fixture. The light bulbs just need to be replaced. So just make sure all your light bulbs are working. Um, and then kitchens and baths sell your house. So the kitchen is the heart of your home and that's where people view that they're gonna do most of their living. Again, um, it, some, relatively inexpensive things that you can do are um, light fixtures now you know there are lots of places that you can go to buy really nice looking simple light fixtures that um, you can replace because brass is out you know a lot of people don't like the brass so um, you can replace those light fixtures and um, appliances you know if you have really old appliances or this is what some people do, and not being critical because I've been in that situation as well, where maybe we've replaced a few appliances as we've gone along. So we've got one that's black, one that's white, one that's stainless. It's really helpful to have all one kind. So maybe if you've got two that are black, you know, you might want to look at replacing the other two. But any of those kinds of things, and tile, ceramic tile, and there are several companies that do a really good job cleaning that, cleaning the grout, really making it look good. Um, so this is, we talk about countertops. Um, you know, now uh, granite and um, uh, Corian are so much more prevalent, so much more popular. As things become more popular, then the prices generally come down and there's so many more places that are offering it, the big box stores. 
So uh, you might want to look at uh, replacing some of that. And especially if you're thinking, I'm not going to sell my house for two or three years. Okay, maybe you want to go ahead and put granite in so you can enjoy it while you're still living there. Um, and then when you're ready to sell it, you've got that done. Because I don't think granite's going anywhere, do you think, Tammy? No, and quartz is really coming. Quartz is coming on. Um, and the other thing that you can add that's not really overly expensive is a backsplash. And again, you can get those um, at any of the tile stores or, or any of the big box stores. Um, maybe new poles, if you have really old poles. Um, you can update a kitchen pretty inexpensively. You can usually buy those for between five and ten dollars each. Um, and even I can put in a pole. A pole. So I know that um, you probably all could do that. Um, then the other big thing we tell people is white linens, white towels, um, whatever you've got that's pink, purple, blue. Let's Put that away you can take it to your new home um, but it just white really uh, looks clean and crisp and uh, doesn't take away again from architectural features in the house and, and things that you really want to show off in your house so that provides a really great look all right so now so now we are we've listed our house maybe it's this spring maybe it's 2018 2019 so when we're preparing, preparing for showing, again, we need for you to pick up and uh, do some things so that you're going to take the greatest advantage of your showing. And if you can't, it is better to say to us, we can't show our house today than to show a house that's not ready to show. So it's better to postpone it. Because most buyers are not going to buy a house the first time they look at it anyway. So they've got time. So why don't you put your dishes away, wash them, make the beds, wipe the counters. I'm not going to even go down all of this list. And we did have some materials here, so be sure and pick some up that, you know, basically tell you the same thing. Um, so we want to avoid um, post-sale issues. So we've sold your house. We got you full price. Everybody's happy. So then we go to the inspection phase, and that's where we do not want you to have problems. So we've got a couple folks uh, here tonight. Um, who have materials, uh, Rob Cahill with National Inspection Service of Indiana and uh, Charles McMahon and his associate from McMahon Exterminating. We recommend if your house is 10 years old or older and even could be younger, that you definitely have an inspection of the house. Even if you just bought the house three years ago because that inspector, as we're all human, they might have missed something, something else might have happened. So uh, we recommend that you have an inspection done and the cost on that depends upon the size of your house. And then you'll have this laundry list of things, hopefully not very long, that needs to be done. And that's what we've got Jeff Head here and there's other uh, really good contractors in town. We recommend that you go down, you fix the things that you are willing to fix. And then if you know what those things are that are wrong with your house, you can disclose them. So you can go ahead and say, hey, uh, I don't have a railing on the stairs. I'm trying to think of some things that aren't that, you know, out the back porch. Uh, because there's some things that the inspectors have to recommend um, because of state laws and codes. And if a buyer knows that up front, then they can base what their offer is going to be on what's disclosed. And um, then there's not an issue, you know, after the sale. So. And we, if you're in an area where there's been a lot of roofs replaced because of wind damage, hail damage, uh, in addition to an inspector, you may want, uh, and uh, Heads, as you know, is, does a lot of roofs, you may want an, a, an, a roof inspector to come as well, as separately. Um, and then we recommend that you hire a qualified contractor uh, because hiring somebody that doesn't really know what they're doing is. Can, can actually cost you money in the long run because then you may have to make other repairs that um, you wouldn't have had to make if you would have hired the right person in the first place. Um, so I know I flew through that, which was my intention because I wanted you all to have time to spend talking to these folks and, and um, 
uh, ask them any questions that you want to ask. I'm going to ask Tammy. Uh, she's going to talk a little bit about um, some other ideas that she may have. And Tammy and her partners own uh, Angele, which is the brand new um, design and gift shop in downtown Evansville, right on Main Street. And so we live on Main Street, so we're very happy to have them as neighbors. And uh, she's giving away a $100 gift certificate later. So we'll have her give a few little tips, and then we'll move on. Thank you, Carol, and thank you, Team McClintock. I appreciate being here. And um, it's always um, a treat when I go into a house and see a great home. They've done everything right, great paint, great things going on. And it feels good when you walk in. But sometimes when you walk into a house, it's like, ooh. So I'm gonna give you an idea of how you can make some changes if you're selling your home or even if you just wanna do some things in your home. Um, the first thing I'd like for you to do, oftentimes I tell my clients, um, take a picture of the room. Put it down, pick it back up, and look at that picture. Really look at the picture. See what bugs you. Because many times your gut instinct will make give you an idea of, oh gosh, that chair doesn't really look good, or there's too much stuff on this table, or the paint color's wrong. There's oftentimes something wrong in the picture. So take a look at the picture and really get a good look. It really does help. Um, another thing that I like to do, as far as I find myself in a home, as far as there, a, a lot of people like a lot of color. So, Keep your house a consistent color in every space, in every in every room. We, um, when we just redid the store, we decided to do just a light, light gray. It almost does. It almost looks white. And we did it through the entire space at the new store that we remodeled, and it made such an impact with all of the things inside the store, from the architecture to the furniture to all of the art on the wall you could start to see things come alive just with a real neutral paint color. It made everything else in the, in the space look wonderful. So I do recommend going with a neutral palette in most of your space. It's okay to do a color, put it in the bathroom, put it in your master suite, but you know, keep the space very neutral so that everything else does show up nicely. It really will make a big impact on the sale of your home as well. Another thing that, that we find when you walk into a room, make sure that you have plenty of room for traffic pattern. If it's a smaller home, make sure that your furniture is the right scale for the size of the room. Sometimes the furniture is too big for the room. You have to walk around it. Those kinds of things can, can often deter you know, uh, someone purchasing your home or even just give you a bad feeling about the space when you walk in. So make sure that there's plenty of walkway, traffic pattern, to get around pieces and, and you know just give you a better feeling about the home too. I come from a, uh, a design back, uh, as a design professional, so I'm thinking about homes when I walk in and what makes me feel good. Design is a science. There's a principle behind design. And it means if there's a balance in the room or if there's rhythm in the room, if there's, you know, all of these things make a big difference on how we feel. It does affect us. So make sure that when you look at your pictures, Make sure when you walk into your space, there's usually something telling you that it doesn't feel good. So take a good look at it. Paint is one of those. Furniture scale is another. Window treatments. How much light is getting into the space? Are the window treatments working? Blinds, are they, are they working well? Are they open? <laughs> make sure that if you have um, you know, particular blinds in your home, make sure that they're open when you show your home and that they do work. I, I drive past homes and Blinds are half up, half down, and you know it's not a very great curb appeal. So just make sure your window treatments look good, and a lot of light is, is filtering through the space. Lighting is another big issue. Make sure that you know when you do, if you're selling your home and you're showing it, make sure you have you know the proper lights on. If it's an evening show, make sure you have your lamps on. Make sure that those things are are. Um, make sure your your recess lights are on. Dim the lights in some areas. Make it look you know, lighting is very, a very big factor in what we do in, in our space. Another thing is, um, you know, if it's an it's a evening sale and you're showing it, there's so many times where you have the right lamps on in the window, it just creates that feeling. 
as people are pulling out, oh, they just want to see more. So make sure your porch lights work. Make sure your lamps are in the right spot in your windows. Make sure that you have the light in your bedrooms at your bedside table. Make sure that all of those little little things in, in the showing really works in an evening built or showing too. Um, make sure that some of your furniture, you know, take a look at your personal furniture too. I know that you're not selling your furniture, but a person walks in the home and they feel like, oh gosh, you know, I want to buy this home, and they and they want to see their own personal things in there. But if they are distracted by tears or you know things of that nature in your furniture, just make sure it looks good. Um, that might affect it as well. Um, what else? I, bathroom fixtures. Make sure that you know your bathroom fixtures look great. Um, bathrooms are key key factor in, in the sale of homes. Make sure that everything's like the stoppers. Play, just make sure that your bathroom's clean, make sure that, that you're, you know, and, and I, I guess, I mean, it's really difficult to, to think about um, going into a bathroom space and the stoppers are, are pulled up, the showers are dirty, or, you know, the doors are dirty, or they need to be windexed, so make sure that's all good. Kitchens, the, the less you have on your countertops, the better, and I did mention quartz is back. If it's probably about the same cost as granite, um, but it is a very good surface for kitchens now as well. So, um, I, you know, I'm coming from a perspective, I'm, you know, from a, a design perspective, so I'm not sure if I'm helping you as far as the house, you know, selling a home, but it's easier to go into a home for me and, and find things that might help to, to help you. So, does anyone have any questions coming from, coming from that point of view or? Yes. What about carpet versus wood? Carpet is great in a home if it's cared for and, and you know, it's, it depends on the acoustics. Oftentimes wood is much preferred in today's bond market. It's great, carpet is great in bedrooms, basements where there's, you know, quiet activity downstairs, but carpet is still being used. Yeah. yeah. And there's light some wonderful dark, carpet. Light or dark light, versus, light, light versus so dark. Irrespective of the light coming into the room, and then we find uh, now more buyers that are looking for hardwood, but still often prefer the carpet in the bedroom. So if you're looking at a replacement in a family room and trying to decide, should I do carpet or should I do hardwood or even a really upgraded laminate? The other really nice thing now is the tile that looks like wood very popular um, go with that hard surface in a family room a kitchen a dining room uh, because that's what uh, buyers are looking for yeah, yeah. great suggestion yes the flooring is a, is a big is a big issue and it changes all the time there is a new luxury tile with vinyl that's beautiful and a lot of people are going with that because it's easy care it is um, scratch resistant and it, some of it, all some of the products that I've used is my. It has a uh, like a nano silver covering that keeps it keeps you healthier, antibacterial. So it's really nice. You know. is, the, is there a tipping point for when you should replace your carpet versus keeping it in the house? It depends on what it looks like. It depends on what it looks, it looks good. Like. The traffic. If there's a traffic, you know, a heavy traffic area that's, that's been used a lot. It just depends on. On what you like and, and preference. If it's light in color, if it looks great, there's really no need to replace it. Yeah. It comes to personal preference too. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna go ahead. Thank you. Did everybody get registered to win? A fabulous yeah. Okay, because we're gonna go ahead and draw out our first one, and we're gonna give away Tammy's. Do you want to draw? I would love to. Okay. <laughs> Ellen Topper is going to draw. going to draw out. Okay. And who's our lucky winner? Denise. Oh, Denise. Yay. All right. <laughs> Desjardins. Okay. And that will get here. We'll just hand this right to you. So you get to come down to Main Street. It's good. And they have a gift shop, too. So, yeah. Find Thank something you. special there. Okay. Great. All right. Our next expert. Rob Cahill, National Inspection Service. 
So I don't know if you have questions for Rob about, yeah, and if you want to come up front, that'd be great, about, and he brought some materials. The other thing while he's coming up, I want to tell you, if any of you are interested or thinking about listening to your house, even in a year or two, well, I did bring with you our team, uh, with us, our team McClintock seller questionnaire. And those of you that have been my clients, Kelly and some others know, um, this is a worksheet. It's sort of like when your CPA gives you that tax worksheet for your taxes. This helps bring everything together. So we have all the information that we need to help you sell your house. So I brought about a dozen of these. So if you're really interested in selling a house, please take one. And um, I think you'll find it very, very helpful. Okay. Okay. Hi, Rob. I'm Rob Cahill with National Inspection Service of Indiana. We've been doing inspections here in the Evansville and Newburgh area for about 23 years. Um, the biggest point, I, I think we'll be kind of repeating ourselves, but in our brochure, I have a list of things to do for an inspection, to prepare your house for an inspection. And it's just 29 simple things that you can do uh, to get your, pretty simple. <laughs> <laughs> but just to me, things that are what I would consider normal home maintenance, like cleaning your gutters and this and that, just a lot of things that people forget about. And it, when you're getting ready to sell your house, it's a good time to remember all that stuff because if that lack of maintenance is most of the time what's causing a lot of the problems that we find. So if you'll go through and look over some of these things before you put your house on the market, before we come in and make things potentially a negative to that new buyer, lots of times if you will do this stuff up front, like getting Jeff out, if you have a, a, a roof that's, you know, that's 10 or 15 years old and you're getting ready to sell your house, have him take a look at it, find out what the problems is. Maybe there's storm damage. In that case, possibly your insurance puts a new roof on rather than, than you, and you now have a selling point to your house versus a negative when somebody's gotta come in and now they know they've gotta spend X amount of dollars or you gotta negotiate the roof. Um, another thing would be with Charlie McMahon with the termite inspection. Have, if you aren't having, if you live in the home and you've been there several years, if you're not having it pre-inspect, or not having it annually inspected, then get somebody under that house and definitely have it inspected. There again, there's an easy way to find out if there's actually termites in your house. You need to know about it, and it's better to fix it and make it a positive. Now you've got a new buyer that you can say, look, I've got my house under termite contract for the next 10 years. So that's another plus of doing some of this stuff up front as a seller. And that's what I would recommend. Just uh, be proactive, uh, take, a, you know, take a few steps to... Uh, uh, get your house up and ready. Uh, I think that's what we're all saying here is, you know, do a few extra things and make your house look as nice as you can because we can all tell you from the years of doing this, I guarantee you when I go in a house and it's clean and neat and I can see the filters are clean and there's service tags on everything, I think, you know, there's, in my mindset, I think these people are taking good care of their house. I go in another house and the, craps everywhere and it's you know it's filthy then you know you go out oh, these people don't take care of their house you know <laughs> so it's it's really uh, you know some minor things that can be done that will help you out and hopefully get you top dollar for your house when you sell it so that's all I've got it's not rocket science and, and I'll just add a couple of the things that we think is pretty simple and one of the, and one of the reasons that and we have these things in our uh, questionnaire is uh, a couple of the biggest things we see is people, I did not go in my crawl space when I lived in a house that had a crawl space. And people may live in a house for seven, eight years, and if they don't have uh, Charlie coming every year to check their termites, that crawl space, worst thing. You sell your house, the inspector comes, the crawl space is full of water. That is not good, folks. So I was telling people, get somebody to stick their head down that crawl space, make Jeff Ed come look at that crawl space, <laughs> um, and make sure that there's not, that's a big thing, the gutters was a really good tip. And then the other thing that um, I always tell people is run, a lot of people don't live in all their house. You know, you have a bathroom that you don't ever use. You might just want to flush the toilet. If you've got a Whirlpool tub that you never use, 
fill it up. Let's run it, folks. Let's make sure that there isn't a drip or because those jets get hard and can break. So there's and some they're really, nasty. And when they're, you run them, if they've sat for a long time, yeah, let's not even go I there. I mean, they blow out all <laughs> kinds of debris. So especially, that's a good reason to clean them before. Especially if you live in a high-rise condo. <laughs> yeah, those are really bad. Yeah. So just you know, it's common sense, but that's a great list, and you can pick. You know, that the only really other good. on that with the gutters, and this is because this comes up today. It came up. It comes up all the time for me on a lot of homes. If you've got downspouts that go underground, know where they discharge. That's always the first thing when people have water in their crawls or water in their. Where's your downspouts? But go, you know. And most people have no clue, and especially if you've got sprinkler systems and these real thick lawns, you get that growing over your downspout discharges rather than that water going out and away from your house it's going right back underneath so those are real and water is probably the biggest issue that we're dealing with in, in the inspection as far as uh, different types of issues normally uh, most of them are related to water when it comes to major problems underneath the houses yeah okay thanks all right any questions for oh Rob. Oh, questions. Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> any questions? Charles, do you have any questions for Rob? I know. Oh, yeah, yeah I think you covered it. Okay, we're going to give away Rob's. Yeah. Yes. What are the, uh, what are the top three problems that you run into? I'm going to say water. crawl water. Water? Water, water, and water, <laughs> and electrical. I mean, water, you, water, you, and electrical. water, water, <laughs> and electrical. But the electrical, lots of times, are simple fixes. There's a lot of, I mean, sometimes it may be bigger issues in the older homes. There's lots of times electrical issues, but certainly in a modern home, GFCIs, and uh, for some reason, most do-it-yourselfers typically are willing to do electrical work. For, I don't know why, but that's the one place they probably should stay away from, but uh, we find a lot of splice wiring and unsafe wiring throughout the homes where homeowners have went in. Yeah, if it's 20 years old or older, we're probably gonna find there's a good chance we're going to find some jury rig wiring or plumbing or something where, uh, and you get out in the surrounding areas, it's worse. You, you know, you get into Boonville or Newburgh. Uh, so, you know, in the surrounding counties, you just, you know, people do things themselves. They don't pay contractors to come out and do stuff. So uh, lots of times that you get things done to that quality. So that's, that's something to be aware of. Anybody else? Yeah, I've got a question mm -hmm. on um, things that when the house was built 30, 40 years ago, and it was up to code at that time, and now you're going to sell, and if it was being built now, it wouldn't be up to code. That's an excellent question, yeah. But, and you know, as an inspector, what I do is I'm gonna note safety issues. Most of that is gonna be safety related. Mm -hmm. Most codes have gotten upgraded like your electric like your GFCIs will be an easy one you know they didn't come in until 1980 for the garages 1972 for the bathrooms 86 for the kitchens so they've continually changed that code and in the end they change them about every three to five years so unless we're doing a brand new home we're not calling code type issues out as far as and a lot of people ask, well, did we pass or do we have to do this? No, you don't have to do anything as a seller. But the buyer, if they're scared off by some type of safety issue, may be able to walk away from the house. So as an inspector, we try to make sure that our buyers, that we're typically usually working for the buyer, knows of all these safety issues. But here's the advantage I see of having your home pre-inspected will be the fact that if say you have no GFCIs in the garage or one that Carol can tell you we run into a lot of copper gas lines okay that used to be a common practice all around here is to run gas lines and copper they don't allow you to do it anymore so if you're listing the house if you have it pre-inspected and you disclose hey our fireplace has a copper gas line going to it well if you've disclosed it then you the seller can't ask you to fix something you've already told them about so that's the, another advantage of having this inspection done prior to listing is that you can then provide the report to that new buyer and say, here's what's wrong with, you know, here's what our inspection said, 
here's the safety issues. We're going to fix this, this, and this, but we're not going to fix these things. Yeah. And that kind of takes away that negotiating tool away from the buyer a little bit. Yeah, it's back to the, they know what they're buying. And, and that, you know, the more we have pre-inspections, the better. Uh, and the copper gas line is a really particularly frustrating because the reason they did that code originally was because of an additive that all the gas, all the companies added to the gas, which made the copper gas lines uh, flake. Yeah. yeah. They don't add that anymore. But, you know, once the state makes a regulation, then to get them to come back and undo it is almost impossible. So we fought that battle with some folks and we won, but it's better to have it disclosed up front and then just say, hey, there's copper, you know, that's, that's the deal. Yeah. Just right. out of curiosity, when did the copper uh, gas launch, when, when did that change? Mm -hmm. When did they quit putting them in? That's a good question because, I mean, honestly, in the code book, you can use copper gas line right now today. In Indianapolis, they allow it uh, in new construction, but it has to be labeled every six feet. There's some of the other issues with copper is the fact that it's not as durable. It, black iron obviously is a lot tough. You know, it's a tougher metal, but uh, yeah, it's it's been in, it's allowed in the code book. The Vectran has not ever really allowed it here in Evansville. It's our Vandenberg County. Now, if you go to Warwick County and you go to Boonville Natural Gas, they're gonna tell you you can still use it right now. It's, yeah. So if you're so, in Warwick County, you're better off right now. We're working on that. So, but yeah, yeah, so like I say, it, that, those kind of get a little tricky on when did they become code? And that really gets tricky for our business. County to county. Yeah. yeah. Where, where is the copper? Do you have to crawl under the house? Usually it's going to be under the house. Okay. You know, most of that. But you can have it run into water heaters. In a, you see it running water heaters. The water heaters, furnaces, fireplaces. But yeah, they'll usually be in the crawl space or the basement. But for the fireplace, it would be under the house. Yes. And it's perfectly safe. Don't worry about your copper pipe. It's your copper pipe. We don't want people to she run from it. here. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, as I long mean, as you're not. <laughs> and I can't remember which one it is. Is it soldered? Or? Well, you don't yeah. want soldered. You don't sure. want soldered, yeah. you want screwed. I have so, seen it. I've seen it soldered. You have screwed, <laughs> you're not screwed. <laughs> <laughs> you have soldered, then it's not. I'll end this with a little joke. This is what I always tell this to my clients. You know what codes were designed for? Yeah. Right. Uh, you've probably heard this. Infants and idiots. Yeah. <laughs> so, in, in essence, a lots of times codes are written when somebody dies in a house. If somebody gets injured, seriously injured, or dies in a house, whether it's a child or an idiot, typically they're going to write a code to try to stop that from happening again. So, that's how codes are written. Yeah. That and lobbyists. Yeah. <laughs> if, okay. if I brought gas into my house, it was, it was not gas before 20 years ago, maybe? Black iron, I would think for sure, 20 years it would have been with black iron. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, these are mostly homes. Usually the yeah. copper, it's going to usually be black iron on the majority of all houses, but then they'll run copper to a water heater or to a fireplace or something like that. What do you charge for an inspection? That's in the price. That's in, the, that's in my, okay. if you grab a brochure, it's got that in there. Yeah, it depends on the size of the house. Okay, thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and draw for Rob's $100 Lowe's. So we'll let Mindy. All right. All right. Who gets to win $100? Sherry Aarons. Sherry Aarons. Okay, here we go. And this is from Rob Cato. There you go. Everybody, everybody can use a $100 gift card. All right, so I'm going to give you that back. Okay, who's next? We want to keep within our time that we can. Charles, you know, he, he already gave your spiel, but <laughs> come up and tell people why bugs are bad. Charles, I love my buddy, I am buddy. This Charlie is Charles McMahon. McMahon. Yeah, thank you, Carol. I'm Charlie McMahon, and I've been doing pest control for 35 years. My family started it 45 years ago. My father started with a paintbrush and a bucket because he couldn't afford to pesticide. 
to actually spray the material around the house. So a bucket and a uh, paintbrush. And today uh, we have 17 employees. So um, our motto is that if you have a pest problem, McMahon can help you out, all right? Uh, I have a handout also, and kind of the same theme. Um, I don't know if everybody picked one up, but basically what I put together here is for sellers, how do you prepare your house for a termite inspection? And the, the, the thought process here, and what we've been talking about all night is, we got a buyer, we put together a price, now we're having the inspections done, and the last thing we want to do is negotiate a price, and you drop the 10 grand, and now we got to have the termite guy in, and we got a $1,500 termite bill, right? So get those houses inspected before uh, you have that buyer, okay? Find out what's in that crawl space. Just like Rob has said and Carol has said, if you haven't gone into your crawl space in any length of time at all, your house should be inspected at least annually, every year. Things change, 365 days we're talking about, right? So um, understand this though, that when you have a pre-sale inspection, it is good for the time of the inspection because that 365 days is gonna pass and things are gonna change. So uh, generally speaking, when we do an inspection on the property, uh, the banks I think will allow the report in, our, in, in the actual report that's provided is the NPMA 33 form. On the disclosure information, it says that the report is good for 90 days. However, most, most lending institutions, see, segue, uh, it's a 30-day deal, is that right? The report is good for 30 days. Okay, so you want to get your house inspected closer to the time that you've decided to call Carol uh, or her team here to get it listed, okay? Inside the uh, handout, we talk about the areas, first of all, it's a WDI inspection, wood destroying insects. So it's not just a termite inspection. We're also looking for carpenter ants, carpenter bees, and wood destroying beetles. Okay? Those are all part of an inspection process for the sale of the home and are all documented on that form. Uh, so there is some good valuable information in here on how you prepare yourself. Firewood, you must don't put it next to the house. If the gutters are full, uh, we're going to create a moisture problem, which is going to become a condition conducive. If we have uh, debris and that sort of thing inside the crawl space, we want to make sure that it's out of there. These are things that we would point out on an inspection report and say to you, we need to get these things moved. I brought with me tonight uh, our lead inspector, Mike Luzignat. We just call him L. Mike L. Because Luzignat is hard to not only spell, but say. Um, so Mike and I are going to be around. Uh, afterward, and we have some uh, some goodies for everybody. Uh, if you have any questions for me now, I'll be happy to take them. But uh, I know there's probably a lot of questions, and Mike and I will both be here if you have questions after after we're done. Anything now? Any questions? Thank you. All right, let's give away this hundred dollar Walton's gift. Does everybody know where Walton's is? Downtown Haney's Corner, new place. Okay, let's see. Let's let one of Ryan Fordson. Not looking. All right, winner is Veronica Davis. Veronica! All right. Aren't you glad you came? <laughs> okay, there you go. All right, Walton, you can take more people down there. All right. Okay, up next we got Jeff Head. Jeff's got Jeff's got to leave here in about three minutes. He's got he's got places to go. So Jeff's been in the construction business for oh my gosh, twenty-two years. Twenty-two years. He's in the famous commercials from the uh, Fall Festival. So and he has no materials here and no business cards. <laughs> yeah, because you don't need them. Who do you think of? I mean, yeah, who do you think of? <laughs> so, well, as Carol said, my name is Jeff Head with Heads. Um, depending on the time of year, I probably look at a uh, inspection, a home inspection report. This time of year, probably a couple times a month uh, in the spring and the summer. Uh, I might look at three or four of them. And uh, something kind of goes in cycles, but it's always crawl spaces. 
there's always something going on in your crawl space. Um, uh, black plastic may not be down, not, not, may not be uh, laid down, uh, or there'll be debris left underneath there, like Charlie was saying, uh, or maybe people have crawled underneath there and the plastic has gotten compromised and it's not running up on the side of the walls. And probably the worst thing about a crawl space is the seal plates. Some of the older homes, the steel plates will will rot out, or termites, or something like that has gotten there and have, and have ate them up, and then we got to crawl in there and um, support them up and dig all that stuff out and put a new steel plate in there. Um, that seems to get caught on a lot um, because people don't go into crawl spaces and they just don't know what to look for. So that's usually a biggie, um, and uh, a lot of times in the attics, people don't know that. that insulation up in the attics will dissipate in time. Um, they, they will fall after it's been up there for 25, 30 years, or the if it's ventilated really well, the, the fiberglass will exit through the house, and now they have colds uh, that actually on a new house, or if you do any, an addition or anything like that, they want like 18 inches of uh, insulation up there, so you have an R value of uh, R38. But, and the biggest culprit of, um, and we get this a lot, um, you'll get somebody in there and they'll, and they'll blow insulation up in your attic and instead of putting some kind of baffle or cardboard or something up in there, they will blow uh, all in your overhang. And uh, uh, then they call us because you should be able to see light in an attic. And uh, if they don't see light, that means that they have blown the insulation all in the overhang. You gotta get up there with a rake and pull that out there and make sure that the uh, attic is breathing. Um, but, and ventilation is also a big one. Um, sometimes roofers will install a ridge vent uh, and they won't cut it out enough. Um, or I've even been on some where uh, the inspector went up there and they found there was no holes. They knew they had vents on the house and the roofers got lazy and they did not cut open the vents. So we've had to go up there and that, that has happened. Um, and people love, we are a lazy generation. We want everything right now. I would call it a microwave society. And we don't like to do no more than we have to. So maintenance free. When you say maintenance free is really huge. Um, some law on the older homes, um, again, the ventilation and um, uh, is a big deal, but uh, you can now, I mean, we can do it, been doing it for a long time, but a lot of times we'll go and we'll cover the overhangs with uh, soffits and fascias. And probably one of the best things you can do for your house on the exterior is put new gutters and gutter guards on. And while you got the gutters off, you can go ahead and put the fascia and soften on there, make sure that your house is breathing. And uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of times that the that water that gets in the downspout, or water that gets in the crawl spaces is because of your downspouts, just like Rob said, or running under and they're backing down through there. And cold uh, says that you're supposed to exit your downspout at least five feet away from the foundation of the house. Um, so <clears throat> we, uh, a lot of gutters. We even go ahead and put gutter guards on there because gutters are inexpensive for what they do. Um, and then just we got like three different gutter guards that we can put on there, uh, inexpensive all the way up to what we call a Rolls Royce. And uh, very important to keep those gutters, um, keep them running and keep them exiting away from the house. Um, now I'll touch real quick on roofs. Um, we get a lot of inspections, the roofs will be nearing the end of their life. And uh, <clears throat> we end up, we replace them. And they got this, what they call a dimensional shingle now. And uh, we like to use what they call a GAF. It's a lifetime dimensional, it's a lifetime roof. And anytime you say lifetime, that means 50 years. Uh, if anytime you hear somebody going to sell you something for a lifetime, that means 50 years. Um, and uh, GAF sells this, sells this particular shingle, and uh, I'm not sure of it, but I can almost bet that you cannot buy an HVAC system and do 
a roof is one of the most expensive expenditures that you're going to have on your house. And uh, <coughs> to get um, the day we pull out of your driveway, you have 50 years on that roof. And, uh, it, you know, roofs are fairly expensive, but on your HVAC system, um, I don't know of any other method you're going to get 50 years out of it. So if you put a little bit better of a roof on there, it don't cost that much more than one of the old three tabs that uh, everybody used to use. Um, probably, I, I would say 99 out of 100 roofs we install are those architectural, those dimensional style shingles because they look good on a house, it, it dresses it up, it gives it good curb appeal. 99 out of 100 are those, are those type of shingles anymore and one out of 100 we might install the old traditional three tab. Um, so they just, because they dress up the house, they're gonna last, they got more of a tar, have more of a tar line, they're less apt to blow off. Just some advantages, and they don't cost that much more to use. So, and tile floors, the ones that look like wood, um, we just got them building a, a house, and we've got that tile all the way through it because you can make them where the grout lines are like an eighth of an inch, and uh, you cannot tear them up. They're water resistant, and scratch resistant, and they were, I can't tell you how the people have walked in and said, Man, these hardwood floors look good. And, uh, I've had this one contractor, he'd been in business for 25 years, and he said, man, those hardwood floors look good. And I was almost embarrassing to say, Scott, that's tile. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there was a question back there. We're doing it right now. We put one on today because it was up in the 50s and it's not, and it's not supposed to get below 40. But, there was a study, we did this apartment complex and the guy, and the guy's son was an engineer. And he did all the studies, he put all the dates, he put all the dates in a computer and he did all the statistics of the, uh, what the weather is like and he really put some research into this. And he said, the third week of April is the best week of the year. <laughs> <laughs> to put a roof on a house because because of the amount of daylight to temperature all the way to the point of the guys the people working on the roof are going to be in better moods and they're, going, they're, not, they're not going to be too cold or they're not going to be too hot I just say I like the spring but we put them on all the time I won't put it on if it's below freezing but I like Put them in, putting them on in the spring because you have all spring, summer, and fall for those shingles to uh, seal. And they're making them heavy enough now that they're going that they're laying down. So, it's we're spring. doing it now. Third week of April is the best time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, any other questions? So we can let Jeff go. He's got a... I'm just going to stick around here now because Mark will take care of it. <laughs> okay. It's not to do with uh, roofing. Um, in 2011, I uh, enclosed my sunroom, and uh, the carpenter did a really good job uh, with the siding and everything. No leaks. Uh, I didn't go ahead and tile it. I left it concrete. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the sliding glass door, it, I had a tiny leak. He came back. Did, he did something. I still have that tiny leak. Uh, when I moved in our neighborhood, that had a, a handyman business. I thought, oh, good. So I got him down there, had him put in a receptacle and cough. Cost me $400. And I thought, oh, wow, um, Still leaked. I got out there and just coughed everything. Didn't leak worse. Uh, had uh, an ex husband that told me how stupid I was. He got out there and pulled all the, it didn't leak as bad. Can you come and fix that with myself? I would love to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell me how stupid I am. I won't do that. Yeah, give her your phone. <laughs> I'll, I'll give her a card. I got a card. She's scheduled for the third week. Third book. Okay, 
She brought some materials as well, and and a hundred dollar Mastercard gift card. So that's even better. So, go Valerie. Good evening. Um, well, I've been with Fifth Third 27 years, and I've been in the mortgage side 25. So to say we've seen a lot of changes during that time would be an understatement, especially in the last 10 years. So what I always like to encourage people to do, kind of tag team with Carol, is do a mortgage pre-approval. And what that does really is it kind of breaks the complicated process down. Um, before you list your house, you want to make sure you go to your bank and have them pull your credit, load in your income so that you can see you know, whether you have to sell your house first before you find another one, or how much down payment you have to make, or are you looking at the right price home for the payment that you want to make. And just the whole process in general I think it makes it go a lot smoother. Um, even if you're not going to buy for four or five months, it's still a good idea to go into the bank and make sure that what you want to do, you can do. Or if you can't do it, that you have an alternative route to go. Because the last thing you want to do is find that house that you love and all of a sudden you can't do what you thought you could do. Or you're scrambling at the very end trying to make it work according to what you have to put down payment in general. So um, the pre-approval process is actually very easy. We just need your income, your social, your date of birth, your full credit, and we make sure that the price home that you want to buy is going to match the payment that you want to make. And more importantly, you may have a payment that you want to make and you're not even thinking that you can buy a larger home to match that payment. Or you might be looking at too much home compared to the payment that you so it just makes you more prepared. Um, lending these days is a little bit more complex than what it used to be. Fair lending is at the very top of the game, so it doesn't matter if it's your first house or your second house or your third house. Everybody answers the same questions and everybody gives the same information in order to purchase that home. What I probably do the most of is help people whenever they don't really want to sell their home first, but their down payment is in the home that they're to sell first, how to structure that loan in order to purchase that new home without selling the other home. Um, and then you can take that equity once you sell it, put it down on the next, on the new loan, and then have your payment recalculated at that time. So there's lots of options, there's lots of products. Um, I have on the back table there the do's and don'ts of an application. Uh, whenever you're applying and it doesn't apply to everyone but it gives you a lot of ideas and don't do this or do this and um, that way when you come into the bank you're more prepared <coughs> and you don't do something that complicates your transaction or maybe even negate it so it's just important to break that process down so I have these in the back along with some calendars if anybody needs them and are there any questions That's okay. About what you're saying. Now, I have uh, a home uh, where I've seen fall free. Right. And uh, I took on a truck two years ago, so I've had two hips uh, done. So I am thinking, and my daughter uh, lives in Louisville, instead of her coming in case I have health issues, she's wanting me. Sure. Um, then you're telling me that, and I have a lot of equity, I have a very small mortgage, I can, uh, without selling first, the houses seem to be selling in our area in like three or four days, sure. they're pending. Um, 
then I will be able to borrow uh, for the new home. Uh, right. For, and, and I will be looking probably at a condo. Right. You so know, it just depends on if your income supports having that old house payment and the new house payment. Uh -huh. But that's what the pre approval kind of discovers is whether or not you can do that right. and how best to structure that loan, not only to buy it, but also after you sell your home, how to get that payment down based on that equity that you have. So that can be done. You don't need to sell stock to go for the new condo. Not necessarily. Okay. Okay, thank yeah. you. So that, it helps me crunch the numbers. You know, I look at your whole financial pictures and I know what questions to ask. To structure the loan, that is the most beneficial for you. Right. And gives you the payment you want, maybe not at, right at that time that you're buying the condo, but after you sell your house, you can you can and see what you can do. Can be restructured and then, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. We're Valerie. We're gonna let you draw. We're, oh. we're on teammates. We'll let you draw for the for your hundred dollar match. Match is on. Yep. All right. Jeff and Jennifer Molzer. There you go. Okay. All right. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Valerie. And thank you, all, all of our experts. Um, so I just want to thank particularly all the experts that came today. And thank you so much. I thought I learned a lot. And I hope all of the rest of you did as well. Um, and we really appreciate you coming. Uh, if you, obviously we've got team materials back there as well. If you didn't get a bag clipped, if you didn't get a brochure, you know, help yourselves. We've got business cards back there. And we're going to do these once a month in the spring. Um, so the next um, session we're going to have is Wednesday, February 22nd. It will be right back here at the library. And actually, I will not be doing, uh, well, I guess you could say I'm hosting it, but Ryan Fortson will be um, the team leader for uh, building your dream home because he's in the process of building a dream home i have never built a home so he is much more of an expert on that than i am so and we'll have a variety of other um, experts here as well to talk about to how, how people can be helped through that process so um, as everybody said they're going to be around here a little bit so if you have individual questions you want to ask any of these folks Please do, if you didn't get a water, grab one on your way. There's also snacks over there. And um, again, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. And um, call us if we can help. We'd love to. Thanks so much.